Hey, welcome back. It's a Thirsty Thursday edition of Liquid Lunch on Newsmax TV. I'm John Tobacco, and uh, we're coming to you today as we do every day, Monday to Friday, noon to 2 Eastern, from the Newsmax headquarters. We're high atop Midtown Manhattan. Um, Usually on Money Mondays, we have the big-time CEOs who talk about money and banking and everything else, but when you get lucky... Uh, even on Thursday, you got to bring in the money men. And uh, joining us today is uh, is a money man himself. Uh, he was supposed to join us a little later, Scott Shea, but we're having you here, and we're going to go deeper in, in our next segment. Uh, you are the, uh, the CEO of Signature Bank. I'm the chairman, the and I'm chair- one of the three founders. We chairman and founder had the idea of to Signature start Bank. This bank. Um, I know about Signature Bank because you have a branch in Staten Island. We do. And it's a... Uh, it kind of embraces that old school kind of community banking where you actually know the business owners actually know the people and they know their names and it's like a, to me it's like an old school that doesn't really exist anymore community banking that's why we started it i mean we started with such a hunger for a bank that would care about people we started with 42 and a half million dollars with no deposits no nothing an idea uh, five branches, and we turned, we broke even in 21 months. We went public in 34 months. And today we're a $50 billion ish bank, and we did it all. We didn't have a down year during the financial crisis because we understood, cared about our clients. So we you- didn't go up and do the crazy stuff, the subprime mortgages and the and the CDO squared and all that. We just stuck to our clients. You weren't accepting some bullcrap AAA rating on paper that you knew was garbage, basically. And you knew your customers so well that you don't want to expose your customers and your reserves to these things because that same thing. Like, you really know your customers, you're not going to put them in that position. So I have a view that there's the golden rule of banking, which is don't make a loan. Don't invest in a security that you wouldn't be happy showing your depositors. Don't think, well, I'm a genius. I can do this. They'll you know, never, they'll understand, never it. understand it. I want it to be simple, one syllable type of, uh, you know, loans that can be explained with one syllable at a time. Wow. <laughs> one syllable. That's, I like that. <laughs> mostly yes. Hopefully. Yeah, mostly, mostly well, yes. Good. Uh, not, uh, not necessarily yes. We say no, too. Uh, uh, Mr. Shea, I, um, and I hope you could stick around because I, sure. I have a number of questions about your book, but I can't avoid taking advantage of your expertise when it comes to the economy. The president has been on a tirade against the Federal Reserve. He wants those interest rates lower and lower and lower, not afraid to let the whole world know that the Fed is responsible for the world's economic problems, or at least America's. What's your view in terms of where we are with interest rates as it relates to the economy as a whole right now? So the first thing I'd say is I think lower interest rates, I don't oppose lower short-term interest rates. I think it can help the economy. We clearly are slowing. But I think the real issue and the real issues we're dealing with are far more, far deeper than interest rates. For example, um, the issues with China. I mean, we've lost so much intellectual property with China. They're the leader in quantum computing, quantum mecha- in, in quantum communication, and in artificial intelligence. Arguably today, that's what the United States is supposed to be, the leader in all of those areas. We've got major issues with our terms of trade. All of those are real substantive issues. Yes, lower interest rates will help. But we shouldn't, uh, unfortunately, that's a sideshow. My view on some of this stuff, you know, I'm I'm a securities finance guy in my real job. Um, And I've felt for a few years now, like when we were running this zero interest, it was like a Ponzi. It was like a government Ponzi to me. You know, why would the banks, the big banks specifically, if they could borrow money from the Fed at zero and then put that money into their trading department and go buy treasuries and get paid two and a half, why would they ever lend? and take risk when they have government on both sides of their trade. And I've been advocating to build rates a little higher, create a little more spread for the bank, create a little more incentive for the bank to right. take some risk on a business, a small business expansion. So, and, and, and each time a little higher, um, at least we have a little cushion built in for when we do have a major problem. So I think you're on the, exactly the right track. I think the, 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 what people don't recognize, and this should be a bipartisan issue in the end, is that by having ultra-low rates, you're essentially taking money from savers and giving it to borrowers. 
And is that really what we want to encourage? I mean, if you care about income inequality, for example, you should want that savers can actually put money aside, earn interest, and be able to afford to retire. So that's why I'm saying these ultra low rates, I would be much happier if we had an economy where we were a technological leader in all of those areas, quantum computing, chips, quantum communication, AI. We were building jobs. You stick around to talk God for a few minutes? I'd love to talk about God. We're going to talk uh, a little more with Scott Shea, chairman of...